It's Monday, um, which is an unusual day for us to be meeting, but it is. Um, and um, Sally, Commissioner Green, is stuck in traffic near, um, well, she called me about 10 minutes ago. She's very close to her house. So um, I just spoke to the attorney folks and asked if we could switch up um, our agenda. And mm -hmm. he said what we can do is uh, we can do our arts moment mm -hmm. uh, and then we can move to public comment and then we can move to announcements, petitions, comments by the board. And hopefully at that point, Sally will be here and then we can move into the organizational meeting. So I just need an okay from um, y'all to do that. You need a motion? Um, John, do you want a motion for that? Okay. So moved. Commissioner McKee? Second. Second Bedford. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Okay. Um, so uh, I'm not going to read um, the um, charge to you all. This is a, uh, our, our uh, meeting space is always a, spa a space of respect. Um, and we welcome everyone here to speak to us and respect each other. Um, so um, with that said, I think the um, we'll do additions and changes to the agenda. And um, if anyone has any additional um, additions or changes. And I see none there. We do have something at our place for 4A, and um, that's the VAD presentation. And with that, I am going to move on to the arts moment. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Doris Friend. I serve on the Orange County Arts Commission Advisory Council, happily. And I'm here to in introduce Pam Baggett, is the author of Wild Horses, described by Kiri Kirby Erickson as, quote, a barebacked, buck naked ride on the slick haunches of fate, all the way from the mystical land of sex, drugs, and rock and roll to the bedside of a dying friend. Pam is a recipient of an Ella Fountain Pratt Emerging Artist Grant from the Durham Arts Council two artist project grants from the Orange County Arts Commission, um, and a 2019-2020 Artist Fellowship from the North Carolina Arts Council. She co-hosts the second Sunday poetry reading series at Fly Flyleaf Books in Chapel Hill, and hosts readings and teaches free writing workshops at the Orange County Main Library in Hillsboro. New poems are forthcoming in Cider Press Review Cackalack, Plain Songs, and Tar River Poetry. When she isn't writing, Pam is outdoors, hiking trails along the Eno River or exploring her own back 40. Pam? Pam, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, good evening. Um, I wanna thank you for your continuing support of the arts in Orange County. My sister was just visiting from Georgia and tells me Georgia is 50th in the nation in its support of the arts. So go Orange County, North Carolina. Um, I write a lot about nature. I've lived in Northern Orange County for over 30 years and I'm someone who spent more time outdoors probably than in. I, so I write about what I love and don't wanna lose. Um, so in this first poem, uh, there's a Latinate name for a native Orange County creature, but I think you'll figure it out from the, co the text who I'm talking about. Sightings, Pantherophis alleghaniensis. Elusive one, you slithered into the underbrush when you felt my footsteps. But I had already seen the long length of your too black to be a stick self basking in the hot dust of the droughted dirt road. Later, I saw a fallen red leaf and thought of you, your bloodless kill, how you swallow your prey whole and warm so you bulge with the suffocated width of it. Like the time I heard a crash on the metal roof at midnight, rushed out to see you fall from the porch as you squeezed the life from a young squealing squirrel. Three days later, the water went out. I found you in the pump house when I ducked inside to reset the switch. 
coiled and sleeping, the lump of squirrel visible in your middle? How many days did you hide? When you came out, how long did that meal sate your hunger? Come, glide into my lap. Tell me what it's like to lose the will to move when cold chills your blood and you curl in a communal den with copperheads. How it feels to shed your skin all at once without fear. Or take a life and not know grief or guilt, only relief at the kill and pleasure in the long rest after. Thank you. I do love snakes, I do. <laughs> you do, I can tell. Um, I also write often about the climate chaos we're living in now. I, I don't expect these poems to change things in and of themselves, but they do remind me, and hopefully occasionally someone else, to take the kind of steps that will bring about positive change. I wrote this in Valley Crucis on a vacation in the mountains. 21st century pastoral. Ignore the white plastic bucket hung upside down on a fence post. Faded blue tarp flung over a pyramid of rusting oil drums. Towering hemlocks turned skeletal by Asian woolly adelgids. And this could be a field a hundred years ago. Red oak, butternut, shagbark hickory framing a mountain pasture. Grass grazed low billows of wild white asters, silken seed heads of native clematis blanketing the lichened wooden fence. Pretend not to see the Japanese stilt grass seeding in the ditch, crowding out goldenrod, purple lobelia. Forget the beer cans, cigarette butts littering the gravel road, the mangy feral cats cowering in an abandoned car. And it appears humans have done little harm here, just carved out a plot for two cows, a sway-backed horse, a small white house with an eight-cord wood pile out back, children that wade in the creek on hot summer days. Turn your back on the pickup truck in the distance, raising dust in another year of record heat, record drought, and you bask in a world in balance where ferns share the creek bank with moss and rhododendron. A hawk swoops down to snatch a mouse from the field, not taking the rest. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do enjoy our arts moments, so thank you for recognizing that. Um, public comment, do we have anyone signed up tonight? No, we have no one signed up tonight, great. Um, does anyone want to speak in public comment? Okay, let's go to announcements, petitions by board members. Um, Commissioner Mark Hopless, do you want to start us off? I have one petition to make, and we're going to discuss a, a NACA representative later in the meeting, but I was <coughs> meant to bring this up before October, which is, I think, when we pay our annual dues to NACO. But I think we should have a discussion about whether or not it's worthwhile to continue paying our dues and being a part of NACO. I honestly can't recall anything that I've been informed of that originated from NACO. And I think we just ought to have a discussion and see if it's worth, worth our while. Okay. That's the National Association of County Officials. Is that what it is? Commissioners, yeah. Yeah, officials, yeah. No. Um. National Association of Counties. National Association of Counties. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Bedford. Uh, nothing for me, thank you. Commissioner Price. Two things. Um, I received a letter in the mail about the High Rock Road uh, Convenience Center and uh, wondering about the renovations. And, um, and I just wanted, uh, it was from a homeowners association, I just wanted folks that live in that area to, to know that the, the renovations were delayed 
but um, according to our director of solid waste, um, the bids will uh, happen early next year, and then it'll be another 18 to 24 months for completion. So I know some folks are concerned about the gravel and the, you know, the, uh, the lack of a few improvements that they were expecting based on a meeting a couple of years ago. So it, it is happening. And the, the other thing that I would uh, want to remind folks of that um, as we're heading into this holiday season, uh, some of our food pantries and um, even with things like toys, um, the social service uh, organizations such as the Orange Congregations and Mission and other social service agencies uh, really would appreciate donations if you have the opportunity to give donations. Um, this is a really tough time, and I understand that there's been a really tough year this year with uh, food supply. Thank you. Commissioner Dorson. Uh, I just want to mention, just before I came here tonight, I was at the Affordable Housing Collaborative meeting, uh, which is the, which is the used to be the Home Program Committee, um, which um, was about allocating the home funds. But we, a couple of years ago, you know, broadened the the scope of that group because it's an intergovernmental group. It includes elected officials from Carborough, the county, Chapel Hill, and Hillsborough, and staffs, the affordable housing staffs. Our new affordable ho uh, housing director was there um, today. Um, and um, one of the things that that group has been doing, had agreed to do a couple of months ago now, is de de developing a countywide vision statement for affordable housing as well as a roadmap for implementation. So. Um, that process is just getting started. There was a community input session that was held a couple months ago. We got a lot of good input, you know, sort of specific things that we're now that we're now working on pulling together into this um, into this countywide vision statement. Um, and I think it's it's you know there's we've talked about this before. There's real um, consensus among all the government officials that we need to be working more closely together to maximize our affordable housing efforts. And um, so that process is moving forward uh, in, a, in, I think, a very positive way. It was the last meeting for Town Council Member Donna Bell and Carver Alder person Bethany Cheney, so there'll be two new members of from those um, boards. Um, but um, all of us were very excited about the, you know, the the path that's being laid out. They, one of the things that was interesting, we were given out this good, I'll, I'll share this, I can scan it and send it to everybody, but we, we got a good list of all the plans that are already in existence. You know, there's a, we have a strategic housing, affordable housing strategic plan. We have a five year consolidated plan for the home program that's required by HUD. We have our Orange County master aging plan, which also focuses on housing. We have our Orange County plant and homelessness, which also includes housing. Um, there's a county comprehensive plan. There's a Chapel Hill housing plan. There's a Carborough plan. So there's a lot of overlap in those and really being able to pull all this together in kind of a countywide, not just vision statement, but a action plan is, I think is gonna be really helpful um, in us beginning to make more progress on our, on our priorities around affordable housing. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Key. Nothing this evening. Okay, I have a few things. Um, <coughs> I'm glad you, you brought this up, Commissioner Dorson, because there was some concern that we're not talking enough about this, um, and uh, it was asked that we speak about it at the Assembly of Government, so um, maybe that group can report out, as opposed to just looking at, you know, pull down things that we've seen a number of times before, may, or report out or just provide this as sure. an information item. I think that would be really good. Um, so uh, we agreed that we were gonna, going to um, uh, write a letter, uh, John is gonna help us with this, uh, about accepting refugees in um, Orange County. Um, I'd like to also add to that, if it's okay with this board, uh, a letter to the governor so he knows that we are um, serious about this and that um, Orange County um, will accept refugees. So that would be a separate letter. And I've sent um, a sample of what that letter looks like. Uh, Durham has already done that. So if that's okay with this board, um, we can include that in with, um, with the, the original uh, request. Um, so there was an um, MMC meeting, managers, mayor, and chair meeting um, this past Monday, a week, for, a week ago Monday. 
and um, we talked a little bit about the sewer hookups on Rogers Road, and um, uh, unfortunately, they sent the, uh, the RFP out and none of the plumbers had uh, replied to it. So we don't have um, that agreement with a, a plumber to help us hook the low and moderate um, income families up. Um, we uh, originally had a memorandum of understanding between the, the three owners of the property um, out there and the three, uh, three um, government bodies that are um, offering money for the sewer. On um, When this came up, we were gonna choose a plumber. All of us were gonna choose a plumber together. Well, that's no longer an option because it's just not working because none of the plumbers have replied to the RFP. Um, so we're thinking that, uh, and I, I think Craig could talk about this a little bit better if, he's, uh, if, if you wanna hear about this because I think that we need to go to a next step on this in order to get some of the folks on Rogers Road hooked up. So if everybody's interested in maybe just a quick, you know, three minutes on what our plan is, if you're willing to listen to that. Yeah. Craig, do you mind? Um, Cause it is a stum, it, it's, it's putting a, it's stopping us from our progress. And so we're gonna have to change it up, which means we're gonna have to change our agreement up with the governmental bodies as well. And you're, so you're saying a request for proposals was put out and there were nobody submitted a proposal? Zero. That's correct. <clears throat> Craig Bentley, Orange County Planning Inspections Director. Uh, this will take just a minute. Um, the uh, interlocal agreement memorandum of understanding um, between our three local governments all signed a few months ago uh, has had a process in it so that we could hopefully expedite uh, the connections to uh, various uh, low to moderate income. Uh, that uh, RFQ went out uh, to have five and we'd rotate and uh, hopefully have plumbers from that uh, maybe even lived in the community. Uh, they did not respond to that, uh, probably a little bit more uh, than, than they had uh, seen because uh, plumbers in most cases like to say, okay, lot A, I'm gonna put 150 foot in, I'll give you a price on that. And we were, we were a little more global with, we have uh, you know, up to 62 uh, various uh, lots, uh, 30 of them may be low to moderate income. So it was uh, possibly a little bit too nebulous uh, for, uh, for them at this time. Uh, we were gonna go modify the agreement, uh, use a system a little simpler, one that our housing department uses for emergency connections uh, to get plumbers, uh, and we'll bring that back as soon as we can to get the local governments to sign on. Uh, we are also uh, continuing our community meetings to get people to sign up and uh, uh, offer their uh, income statistics so that we can uh, be ready to go uh, once we have the, the plumbers in line. Questions? Thank you. Thanks, Fred. So we'll, we're just gonna keep moving on that and we'll, we'll get that agreement back to us as soon as possible. Um, we also spoke about um, uh, the Green Track governance document um, at the MMC meeting and uh, we are at the phase where we're going to have um, a facilitator come in. Uh, Chapel Hill requested Maggie Kodis um, to be to facilitate that meeting, um, and it will um, be with our attorneys and the manager and the the mayors and the chair, and um, that would be to work out some language on um, what um, the governance document looks like. Um, as you recall, on September 3rd, this board met in closed session and gave so, uh, some direction for us to move forward with a governance document. Um, Travis took a stab at some language just to put some language out there. It wasn't anything that was set in stone or um, his words, you can accept it or burn it in flames. Um, but we, um, Chapel Hill didn't like that very much and they wanted to go back to a, a more uh, of, of a process. Um, so we're, we're going to set that up. Um, uh, I believe that um, our staff is gonna get in touch with Maggie to see if she wanted to facilitate this meeting and um, as soon as we have a date on that, I can let everyone know the process, what that process is going to be. Um, the mayor of Chapel Hill did talk about uh, an environmental study that, um, that they um, sort of wanna move forward. Um, it was, uh, the, the study she said was gonna be between 25 and $30,000, um, but we were unclear um, at this last MM, M MMC meeting of um, what, what the scope of the study is. So we still, like we know that there's gonna be a study, but we, did, we didn't really have uh, a clear scope from Chapel Hill. Uh, Craig um, offered up uh, an Army Corps of Engineer uh, coming out and taking a look at the property. Um, 
but it just didn't, it, it, that, didn't real, that, that part didn't really seem to mesh out, mesh out yet, so we're gonna have to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but, but the, um, the uh, governance document um, will be moving forward. Um, and so I'll keep you updated on that. Some topics have been suggested for the Assembly of Government, uh, governments. Are you moving yes, off sir. the governance topic now to another I item? am. Do you want to ask a question yeah, about that? Can yeah. you just explain to us exactly what this governance document is supposed to do and why we need what? I mean, so, we all own the property jointly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so is this going to be something that says, you know, how we're going to vote to do things? Is it going to be something like, um, I mean, yeah, do we not have anything like that in place now? And what uh, what exactly is the purpose is, I guess, what I'm trying to yeah. understand. So uh, I'm going to ask Travis to come up, and while he's coming up, I can tell you that we have um, a, an original document from 2000, 2001, where there was um, s some sort of um, organ organization of thoughts of how we were going to move forward with building affordable housing on the green track. Since then, though, um, Chapel Hill, uh, with that, the green tract has, has become part of the ETJ of Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. So that document in 2000, 2001 um, doesn't really help us, uh, guide us on how we can um, work as partners together. For example, if two of the partners want to do something and one of the, part the other partners doesn't want to do it, how do we move forward? How does that happen? So it, am I explaining that right, Travis? Do you want to expand on that a little bit? So I, yeah, I think conceptually what it would do is establish a process to get, get this current process, uh, get us to decision points from, from sort of this current process, and then uh, what would happen if we can't reach a three-party agreement. And uh, it, you know, I think that's likely where things have gotten held up before in this three, three-party ownership deal is that uh, consensus wasn't reached and then the only option was really a stalemate. Um, so hopefully this would define a process to get us to some de decision points and then what happens if consensus can't be reached by all of the parties. Does that make sense? But we're going to have to reach consensus to decide that. Maybe. Right? Maybe. There, I mean, there are, I, we're also, you know, given the way that the ownership was set up, it's, uh, you know, jointly owned, and so uh, each of the parties has, would have an option to buy another share. You know, there are a variety of different ways to, to make that work, and we just need to figure out which ones are most plausible. And, and we're not going to be able to move forward with anything regarding affordable housing until we get all that in place first, right? Correct, yeah. Commissioner Green, welcome. Chair, I have a, thank you. Um, I have um, a follow-up question about the environmental study. Uh, is, I'm puzzled, puzzled why it's not clear what needed to do, what you said. And, and just for a little context, I want to just remind everybody that um, there has been some work on the ground done. I mean, there's some word out there in the community that it was only just looking at maps. That's not true. There was some work already done. Absolutely. So I, I thought that there was an understanding of what else needed to be done, so I'm curious why that's still a hang-up. It wasn't clear when, when we were at the, the MMC meeting, it wasn't clear what, I mean, w we asked a number of times what Chapel Hill was at, was what, what the scope was, but w it wasn't, we didn't get a definite answer of, of what they wanted in that scope, like is it is it just the 60 acres? Is it in the entire piece of property? Um, you, you know, it's it's really unclear to me, I, and I don't know, Travis. Maybe you can help us again with this, but we didn't we didn't get the feeling we, we got the feeling that they they know that they want an environmental study, but they don't know what they want to do with that. You know, what part of the land they want the study on, and that's why Craig offered up um, the uh, Army Corps of Eng Engineer coming in. Um, because there's been all these accusations that there's a stream there, that there's things that, you know, can't be touched, and um, all that has to be, um, you know, uh, studied and, and um, made a fact as opposed to just, you know, neighbors talking about what's out there. So, yeah, we're, that's, that's the next steps as well. 
And you're right, we did do a study. There is an environmental study. That's how we, that we, we staff did this study and we, that's how we came up with it, some, some of these suggestions on the maps. And again, they were only suggestions. Yes, Commissioner Mark. Following up on what Commissioner Green said, those of us that have walked out there and seen how the map reflects the environmental study that was done, I mean, the creeks are protected and you can walk out into the, the land where you would, where affordable housing and mixed use development would, was projected to be based on that plan, and it all makes total sense. You know, as far as I could tell, that work was done to bring us to, to the point where we could start making serious decisions, and all of a sudden we're backtracking on some uh, vague environmental restudy. I wonder if we can't get, I mean, I just wonder how many people have walked out there that are discussing this. It, 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 it seems that, it seems to me that, that <coughs> we would benefit if a lot more of elected officials would go out there and see the land and look at the map and understand the reality by being on the property. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Price? Uh, I think that where some of the confusion is coming in, at least from what folks have said to me, is that for whatever reason, the environmental study wasn't conclusive enough wasn't what enough? Conclusive to say that you hmm. can put, you know, a certain intensity or density of housing here or school there or what have you. And that for some reason another one is necessary. So if it is, they just want it to, to happen so they can, because the, the folks in the community want to see development. Yeah. All I'm saying and is, I mean, is that my, my experience being out there and looking at the map was that we're 90% we're there. Right, yeah, we don't I need mean, another I, I, study. I've, I've walked it, and, a lot, and of course, the people that live there, they know it, you know, almost blindfold. They know it's out there. But I guess for, I mean, to be able to say that you can put, you know, whatever type of development out there, you still need to know. Just, I mean, a perfect example would be that, you know, just putting the, running the sewer through the neighborhood. They didn't expect that much rock underneath. So I, I think that's where the environmental study is coming in. I'll keep everyone posted as we move forward. Uh, uh, Carborough's concerned. Um, they want, Carborough certainly wants to have this um, governance documents um, up and, and agreed upon before they um, agree to spend any more money. Like I said, the, uh, the study was quoted to us at $25,000 to $30,000. We had already spent a good amount of time and money as well as $25,000 on the Jackson Center to um, get us to where we are today. So I'll keep everyone posted on that one. We'll certainly be talking about that at the Assembly of Governments also. One question. Now, yeah. you said um, $25,000 to $30,000 for it. And said, um, is that the one that Chapel Hill is planning to do on its own? Or are you talking Chapel about Chapel Hill is own? not planning to do anything on their own. Well, they said that in the in the collaboration meeting that they were going to go forward with an environmental study? They're, they're, re they're requesting that the partners join them in the study. Okay. Um, so it, w it would be hard for Chapel Hill to do something on their own since we're all partners also. Well, I know that, but that's what they said. I yeah, I know. Uh, um, so, so Assembly of Government, Green Track, um, update. With it. I'm just going to run through these, and you know, just just to keep get, give everyone an idea what's going on. They want the green track update. Um, they want to have a census update, a climate commission report, um, homelessness and food council, and that could be a report. That doesn't have to be a presentation. Uh, update on emergency service and um, the uh, update on the what the transit steering committee is going to be doing. So those are the topics that we have. Commissioner Green, before you came in, um, Commissioner Dorson told us about um, the housing, um, what, what is it called now? Uh, the Affordable Housing Task Force. At the task force, and um, they got some really good stuff. You, were, you wanted to get that onto the assembly government. I think that we can get a report out on that um, from that collaboration, so we'll add that to it. Um, okay, um, that is the end of that. So let's um, all, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner Commissioner Bradford. Green might have some petitions or whatever comments. Oh, did you have anything? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, my only comment is that there were uh, traffic backups in the Chapel Hill Carborough area, and I apologize for being late. Okay. <laughs> I didn't mean to skip you. Um, all right, so we're going to move back to the beginning of our meeting, folks. Um, and I won't go right, I won't, 
say the date or anything like that. We're just going to move right into um, our um, organizational meeting, which is election of chair and vice chair, and we'll do um, the clerk to distribute ballots for the board chair, and then um, she will read those results. Oh, okay. okay. Sure. Um, I will read who the person chose and who actually signed each of the ballots. Okay. Ballot for board chair Penny Rich signed by Sally Green. Ballot for board chair Penny for Penny Rich signed by Mark McCopolis. For Penny Rich signed by James Setta Bedford. Penny Rich signed by Renee Price. Penny Rich signed by Penny Rich. Penny Rich signed by Mark Dorson, and Penny Rich signed by Earl McKee. The chair for 2020 is Penny Rich. Thank you all, I appreciate it. And now we're gonna do, um, for the vice chair, the same process. Mm -hmm. The clerk will pass out the ballots oh, and read the ballots afterwards. For Vice Chair, Renee Price signed Sally Green. Renee Price signed Mark McCopolis. Renee Price signed by James Setta Bedford. Renee Price signed by Renee Price. Renee Price signed by Penny Rich. Renee Price signature by Mark Dorson. And Renee Price signature by Earl McKee. The Vice Chair will be Commissioner Renee Price. Thank you. Congratulations. Do you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? Oh, just thank you. Look forward to another year. Okay, awesome. Let's get back to business. Thank you all. Um, this is one of my favorite things. We're going on to uh, 4A Voluntary and Enhanced Agricultural District yeah, designation. The, uh, have to do the NACC and NACC. Oh, I thought we were going to do that next time, no? No. We're going to do this this time? Sorry, folks, hang on one second. Sorry, Gail. <laughs> Gail was moving up front, she was like, yay. Okay, um, the, so we do have a petition about NACO, but um, let's put uh, people in that place anyway, Commissioner Markopoulos, and then if we come back with a decision then. Like I said, I think the dues are due in October, so we got time. Okay. Um, okay, so um, we, we need um, NCACC, which is our local, uh, County Commissioner Align Association and the national one is NACO. Currently, Commissioner Price holds both of those seats. No, I hold the NCACC. You do? <laughs> oh, so it's wrong on here then. Okay, thank you for that correction. So, do we want to make any nominations? Do we want to take. Um, yeah, that's wrong on there then. Thank you. If if Commissioner Dorsen would accept it, I would nominate Commissioner Dorsen for another term. I forgot about that. 
Well, I'm happy to do it again, unless, in, as is my want, unless someone else is interested who hasn't ever done it and is interested in having the slot. I'm, I'm welcome to, I'm happy to pass the baton, as they say, but I'm, if no one is, wants to do it, I'm happy to stay on. Well, I, well, I'd like to do it if that's, if you're truly agreeable. That's, yeah. I'm absolutely agreeable. Then I'll withdraw. Is that, that's you want to withdraw that? I appreciate that. I yes. will nominate yeah. James Edda. Yes. And I'll nominate. So if James Edda is nominated and we have a second? I just did that. Yes. <laughs> okay. All those, in, oh, any other nominations? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Dorson, all good? Absolutely. All right, all is in favor of uh, Commissioner Bedford being our NCACC 2020 rep, say aye. 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 Against? All right, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, now we, we have the, um, the NACO voting delegate. And again, if uh, Commissioner Price would accept it, I'll nominate Commissioner Price for another term on NACO. I appreciate it. I actually do get quite a bit out of it. I do. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Nominations? Okay, we have Commissioner Price. Um, all those in favor? Wait, we have well, one. We, we need a second. Does anybody else want to do it? Just before we ask, because again, in the interest of passing the baton around, if someone else wants to do it, well, I think it would be... Yeah, well, no one had... I've so. done it once before when I first came on. I, I wouldn't mind doing it again, but I, you know, I don't want to... Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing it again. I did it, I did it way back when, once. Commissioner Price, what, what is your, I mean, you've expressed an interest in it again. Well, I'm on several committees anyway. I'm vice chair of arts and culture and justice and public safety, so I'm active anyway. The, and so it's fine. The voting is, well, as long as, you know, if anyone wants to stay an extra day in Florida <laughs> next <okay>. year. <laughs> Then I'll yeah. oh, you, you do that again. Rich, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have Commissioner Rich, and we need a second on that. Second. Okay, by Sally, um, Commissioner Green. Sorry. Um, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Against? Okay. So I will be the NACO 2020 rep, um, and then we'll have that conversation uh, about the petition in October from Commissioner Montcoplos. Okay. I'm good now, Donna. I can move on? Yes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. All right. Now, Gail, welcome. So like I said before, this is one of my um, favorite things that we do here, and um, especially because you work so hard at this. So take it away. Let me get the PowerPoint up. I'm going to take one more look. We had, uh, I had several farmers who said they were going to try to come. But of course, it's very busy time of year. But I did have um, a couple of them that did specifically say they apologized they would not be able to come. Uh, one had to take their pet to the veterinarian today, and and it was not a good day. So they were having to stay home with the animal, and uh, so we have other things going on. So I'll um, jump right into it. We've got seven farms tonight to present. Um, these farms are from north to south, and so we have a very good representative of um, some very small farms and some larger farms. So um, I'll move through these. Um, just very quickly, as we typically do, the benefits of the agricultural districts. Um, the voluntary, just as a reminder for the board, the Voluntary Agriculture Districts, um, the VAD, is a 10-year commitment for the farm uh, that they will stay in active farming production. But if something does change at any time, they can ask to be removed out of the program. Uh, of course, there's no penalty, there's no fee, that type of thing. Uh, the Enhanced Voluntary Ag District, the EVAD, is an irrevocable 10-year commitment to be in the act of farming production. Uh, therefore, the farmers who are in this do receive some additional benefits of potentially up to 90% cost share rates and a priority on state and federal grant fundings when applicable. Uh, just uh, very quickly, I won't read out to you. Um, the benefits include, uh, the biggest benefit is making public aware of them around them aware that they are active farms and uh, anyone moving into the community are aware that the farms do exist there. Um, so that's um, many of the big, uh, and you, as you ride through the county, you see the signs that we have up and uh, they're becoming more and more 
around the county, which is, uh, I think, is a good thing. So we'll start off first with one of our farms, just right here on the edge of uh, Hillsboro. We have the Richard Samoleski, who's the owner uh, for Scuppernon Estates, LLC. And uh, his farm manager is Keegan Sins, uh, I always mess his name up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, he's a farm manager for Eno River Farm. Many of you have seen it um, uh, out on the St. Mary's and Lawrence Road intersection. Uh, the farm is a total of 178.18 acres. Uh, it is in the Sly Eno district. It's one parcel of land now. We're requesting an ownership change. This particular farm, at least 150 acres of this farm or was in the program, in the VAD program, originally from 1992 under the Barber family ownership. And, uh, but they are also uh, having, having an additional 28.18 acres. They're raising, um, they're in the process of planting strawberries. Uh, they've planted them, some of the pictures you can see here. Blueberries, horticulture crops, greenhouse, hayland, and managed woodland on those 178 acres. Our next farm is probably the smallest farm that we've uh, requesting enrollment into the program, Manley and Kathy Palmer. Uh, their farm is Palmer Family Show Pigs. So they're requesting the Voluntary Ag District. They are on 3.39 acres in the Caldwell Ag District. They have sheep, pastures, and show pigs. Who couldn't love that face, right? <laughs> that, oh. They raise competitive swine that they go to shows up and down the East Coast. So the face of that pig you see is one of the grand champion winners in um, some of the other state competitions. Uh, as I say, they, I go to all of these farms if I'm not familiar with them and they are very actively farming on a very small acreage. Our next farm is William and Amanda Berry. Uh, they are requesting a voluntary agriculture district on 236.15 acres. They are also in the Caldwell Ag District on seven parcels of land. They raise beef cattle, pasture hay crops, and manage woodland. The next, um, many of you are very familiar with Chapel Hill Creamery, Portia McKnight, and Florence Hawley. Uh, they are asking for requesting the voluntary ag district on an additional 12.17 acres in the White Cross Ag District area. Uh, it's one parcel of land. They have a dairy cattle operation, pasture, and hay crops. These are additional acres to their existing acreage farm. Uh, their additional, uh, their existing acreage farm is 37.07 acres. So they've purchased an additional 12 acres. Mm -hmm. The maps you may have with you um, show that it's woodland, but they have since cleared that and they are actively getting it into pasture so that uh, they needed more pasture for their cattle herd. The next farm is located down at the corner of Highway, Busy Highway 54 and Mebane Oaks Road. It's uh, James and Elizabeth Hooten, Glen Oaks Farm. They're requesting to be enrolled in the Voluntary Agriculture District, 38.09 acres. They are in the Cane Creek and Buckhorn Agriculture District. With four parcels of land. They have beef cattle, pasture, and hay crops. And the next is one of our own. Um, many of you may know Jason Shepard. He is our Orange County Fire Marshal, but he is also a farmer. And he's requesting our Voluntary Ag District enrollment on 42.38 acres in the High Rock Eflin Ag District. He's raising hay crops, soybeans, and managed woodland. Jason apologizes he could not make it tonight. He is out of town on training, or he said he would be here. And the next farm uh, that we're asking for enrollment is Annette and Mark McLish. It's, uh, they're asking for enrollment in the voluntary ag, and it's 14.1 acre in the Cedar Grove Ag District, uh, one parcel of land. They have goats, heritage turkeys, guineas, chickens, beef cattle, bees, and pasture. So quite a lot of animals going on out there. Beautiful little farm. So those are the seven farms, all of these farms. The Agriculture Preser Bo Preservation Board has approved all of these farms in their either September or November meetings as presented. 
And uh, we are tonight requesting approval from the commissioners to accept these seven farms into the program. And rounding the acres would be an additional 375 acres into the voluntary ag district, ag district program. With this approval, the enrollment will be increased to 121 farms for a total of 12,868 acres in the VAD program and 2,566 acres in the EVAD program for a total acres of 15,434. My next slide just simply shows the overall map with the red images indicating where these farms that we've just talked about. Now just very quickly uh, up here in the very north is the Berry, William and Amanda Berry farm. The little dot right there, very tiny, is the Palmer farm. We'll move over, the, this is the McLish farm, the Shepherd farm, Eno River farm, and it does border the Eno River on both sides, uh, the Hooten farm, and the McKnight, or uh, Chapel Hill Creamy, Creamery down here. So those are tonight the farms that are before you for uh, your vote. Thank you, Gail. Uh, questions for Gail? No, Commissioner Ricky, you have no questions? Okay. No sibling rivalry right now? Okay. Um, this is great. I, I, it, I'm, like I said, I'm always um, thrilled to, to accept these acreage into, into this, and, and I know you work hard to, to get the farmers to do this too, so thank you so much for all your hard work and your board. You know. um, if there are no questions, we need a motion to accept these into the uh, VAD and the EVAD um, for a total of 15,434 acres. So moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Price and McKee, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? And I have one comment. Okay, I, I think Commissioner McKee uh, and then Commissioner Price. If I might ask uh, the uh, folks that are represented in these farms, would you ask them to, uh, would you introduce them? Do you have any of them here? I don't think there's anyone here. Mm. This, okay. this large group is for our next <laughs> uh, awardee. Okay. Ms. Uh, okay. I knew Which I saw a large group of people and I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> and that, that's why I looked around to see if there was any other faces. Okay, no, that, um, that's, checking that's you, right? Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Price. <laughs> well, I happen to know that this is Gail's last time to present. Yes. And I just want to say that you have done a fantastic job over the years. Thank you. And um, I think Orange County is all the better. I don't know what we're going to do without you. I, I mean, I know that. you're going to be around, and I, you know, you got to check after, <laughs> check up on Earl and, and David, but um, <laughs> your brother. But I just want to say thank you so much. I mean, to be able to bring farmers into this program, I mean, because people are doubtful of government, very doubtful of government, and you've just had a wonderful way of dealing with people and moving this program to, you know, to where it is now and so I just want to say thank you thank you so much I appreciate that I appreciate those kind of words um, in 2012 um, I, of course we uh, soil and water is in the deeper department and um, but we have a separate soil and water board as most of you know mm -hmm. and um, we the program uh, we had membership in the program but it wasn't by it wasn't being run by an individual who was familiar with the farmers and so when that individual moved on to another job, there was no one running the program. So I went to Dave Stancil, and we talked amongst ourselves and the board members and thought it would be a good program to be in the soil and water division of the deeper. And so I went and talked with Dave, and I appreciate Dave giving us the opportunity to take that program into the soil and water division and expand it, and it's been very successful. Uh, but we, we work with a lot of these farmers, but a lot of the farmers were very, very interested in the program. So they're the ones that make the program as successful as it is. And, um, and then word of mouth and more signs. Um, I've already got three applications on my desk right now for uh, <laughs> January or, you know, Peter, Peter uh, will be staff. We will still have staff, of course, to the Ag Preservation Board. We have a very active Ag Preservation Board. We have 14 very active members, all farmers, mm -hmm. are on the Ag Preservation Board. So I think it's a program that really has evolved. And um, so, but it's, uh, the interest is there. Um, so 
but thank you very much. Appreciate Enjoy that. Enjoy retirement. <laughs> thank you. I think the signs are really helpful. I think it really it, it promotes the program, but I think it, it also for folks to understand what, you know, as they're driving around to see the signs, because they hadn't been up for very long, had they? No, they yeah. had not. No. So I think they're really great. We had a few here and there, but yeah. not many. But now they're, they're scattered everywhere. Yeah, and it's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, commissioners, before we move to um, 4B, I was supposed to ask a question that I forgot to do at the beginning. Um, and this was um, next week when we pick our board, uh, boards and commission selection. Um, we had sent, uh, Donna and I had talked about it, and we sent it out early to everyone. So everyone should have gotten that email um, with uh, the procedure and the boards and commissions. And we'll switch, we'll change that one up, that NACO and, and the NCACC. Um, but, but, um, the process that we chose, if, if you wanted to save one board, you get to do that at the beginning of the process. Um, but Commissioner Dorsen, I'm, I'm hoping you can help us with this. You did not save um, a board last time, and um, I'm, I'm thinking you're probably gonna do the same thing, and I probably will also. Um, we just wanna make sure we have the process down. Does that mean we go through all the saves and then um, you and I would get to choose a board before we go into the second round? Do you remember if you did that last year? I think I think what we did, I can't remember exactly, but I think that I just didn't pick a save and then we just did the regular picking. You know, I just, I don't think I went first or anything like that, I think. Okay, so you didn't select one in, 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 instead of your save? No, no. Okay, so the question is for the commissioners if we want to do that or not, because that would mean that, it, that, that it, again, I'll use Commissioner Dorson and myself as an example, that means that everybody has has picked a, uh, a, a board or a committee and we haven't. Do, do you, are you following? I'm following, mm -hmm. but you've had the opportunity. Had the opportunity to save, but if you didn't want, that, I'm just asking what the process is. I'm just asking what everyone thinks the process should be. We don't have to decide it tonight, but we have to decide it by tomorrow. <laughs> <But> I, I, <laughs> Com Commissioner Markopoulos. I think it would be fair for you all to get a first pick at that time. If you forfeit picking a board, then we're all on you know, even even ground as far as having the same number of committee assignments as we move forward? Yeah, I think that, I, I would just maybe modify that. Anybody that wants to save, go ahead and save theirs, and then if the two of you don't wanna save, or whoever doesn't want to, then you pick, and then we start the whole round robin. Yeah, that, I think that's, that's what he so, yeah, so, so you raised the question, so what if, if like three people don't save, how do you determine who goes no first idea. among those three? Well, no, what I meant was so that, say, you wanted to save, um, like, swag. Um, you would save that before I would um, vote for it or pick it. That way, I mean, right, right. That, that's what I was getting Yeah, at. yeah, sure. Well, we could do the same thing sure. alphabetical by, by, um, by uh, seniority. We could do it that way, yeah. if that's, that's okay good. with everybody. Consistent. Yep. So, so this we can, everybody starts off with one board then. Yeah. Is, is that, yeah. is that gonna be okay with everyone? Yeah. I don't think we have to vote on it or anything because we don't have a policy. This is just a procedure and Donna wanted to make sure she wrote the abstract right. Right, because it's <laughs> written the way y'all decided back on. Right. I, previously uh, and, last month or not okay so does that does that make sense to you now yeah we can uh, update it in for agenda review tomorrow okay we'll make a corrected one and make sure we got all the information so when the agenda is published on Thursday we'll have all the correct processes in place okay I apologize for forgetting to ask that up front um, so everyone's good with that right we can move on okay yeah, so did you say yes, that sir. already got sent out to us it did okay. Today, okay. This oh today this okay Fine. it did um, so we're gonna move on to 4B, proclamation recognizing uh, Catherine Cheek. The board will consider voting to approve a proclamation recognizing and expressing gratitude towards Catherine Cat Thompson Wilkerson Cheek for her devotion and service to the people of Orange County. And Commissioner McKee is going to read that proclamation and Cat, if you can come forward. Good evening. Good evening. How are Welcome. you doing tonight? Nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Orange County Board of Commissioners proclamation recognizing Catherine Cheek. Whereas Catherine Cat Thompson Wilkerson Cheek was born in Orange County and whereas 
She has been a driving force within the community and especially the Sly Grange organization. And whereas Catherine assumed the role as president of the Sly Grange in 1983 when it had only six active members, and whereas under her leadership, the Sly Grange became the largest Grange in the state of North Carolina with more than 150 members. And whereas the Sly Grange was built in 1948 using funds that the Grange won in a contest to receive a $50,000 prize from Sears and Roebuck, and whereas the Grange being in disarray at her start as president, Catherine led fundraising to return the hall to its former glory, serving as a meeting place for many community events. And whereas under her leadership, the Grange added to its dictionary program <coughs> that has delivered over 10,000 dictionaries to third graders in Orange County schools. And whereas the Grange has promoted rural agriculture as a strong supporter of the FFA slash 4-H Junior Livestock Show, now in its 73rd consecutive year, as well as hosting numerous sessions at Orange County Agricultural Summit, and whereas Catherine is one of the few women in the nation who served as president of a Grange chapter, and whereas, including the 36 years since she first became president of the Sly Grange, Catherine Cheek has helped to improve the quality of life in Orange County. Now, therefore, let it be proclaimed that the Orange County Board of Commissioners recognizes and expresses its deep appreciation and respect for the services rendered by Catherine Thompson Wilkerson Cheek and expresses her well in and wishes her well in her retirement. This is the second day of December 2019. Penny Rich, Chair, Orange County Board of Commissioners. Congratulations. Would Catherine. you like to mo pass that? May I move a motion? Make Thank a you, motion. Earl. Could I say a motion? Few, I say, <laughs> I say a few words. You uh, One I second, think. Catherine. Let's all vote on this so we can make sure make it official. Okay? Go all now. those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? All right, thank you. Uh, most of you know that uh, there were quite a few Granges in Orange County. Uh, right now, Sly Grange is the only Grange in Orange County. And it's Sly Grange located in the Sly community, but it is an Orange County Grange now <coughs> because we have members from all over the county, north, south, east, and west. Uh, we pull members from uh, Granges that folded uh, from New Hope Grange, Bob Strayhorn there. I said, Bob, I want you to reactivate New Hope Grange. He said, no, I'd rather come to your Grange and you do all the work and just <laughs> let me be there. But of course he came and worked with us and also Richard Roberts, who's deceased now, with the St. Mary's Grange. And we pull these Granges in and White Cross and Buckhorn and all of these people that came from these other Granges. And I couldn't have done it without my husband, Milton Cheek. He came from the Chapel Hill community over on Old Federal Road. And Milton worked and worked and worked at the Grange with me. So now we have representatives all over the county. And I want to say to you county commissioners, we appreciate the way you came out to the rural area in Orange County to see what we were doing and became a part of us. And uh, Sally Green can push a mop pretty good and clean <laughs> tables. And Renee was a member of the Grange and, and Earl and of course Barry Jacobs. So we appreciate you coming out to rural Orange and being a part of us and letting us be a part of what you're doing in Orange County. And we're really proud of our county commissioners. Thank you so much. And don't go anywhere, because Commissioner McKee is going to come over and take a photo. And then I'm going to ask all those folks out there to come up front and take a photo with Catherine. Okay, folks, I want you all to come on up and take a picture with Catherine, please. Earl, move, move, put her back here with the, so we can have her. Come on, folks. Come on, come on. You all came out. You got to get a photo. Yeah. We'll, we could stand, Earl. It's all right. Just give me a photo. Yeah. We'll stand there. There we go. So we can take a photo. 
that would be a good picture. A Grange membership? Go, absolutely. Y'all are going to have to stand. That's fine. <laughs> Wait a second. How do you get in front of me? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's funny. That's awesome. Well, I'll ask her comments afterwards. <laughs> We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. No, no, no. We're fine. All right, look at the camera. That's one, two, two, three. Do one more. All right. Thank you all so much. We have someone that would like to speak to this. All right. This is your. This is your. Come on, Alice. Go for it. No, Alice. What? Please tell us who you are. I'm Alice Hunt Seeley. Welcome, Hunt, Alice Hunt Wilkerson Seeley, <laughs> and I would like to thank. Orange County for recognizing in Catherine what a very small group of us recognized at the other end of this complex in the early 1940s and even more as we walked out of this auditorium in the mid-1950s. We recognized immediately her compassion her love, and her leadership qualities. And they developed even more from the first grade onward. And Kat, who was smarter than most of us, graduated a year ahead of us. <laughs> so we can't claim her in the class of 1955, but we love her in the class of 1954. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for recognizing what we recognized a long time ago. Thank you. That was lovely. Right. Yeah. We love her. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we do too. Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Okay. We are moving on to 4C, and this is a proclamation recognizing Robert Dowling. The board will consider voting to approve a proclamation recognizing and expressing gratitude toward Robert Dowling for his devotion and service to the people of Orange County. And Commissioner Green will read that. Thank you. A proclamation recognizing and honoring Robert Dowling, retiring executive director, Community Home Trust. Whereas Robert Dowling, after serving as a banker in the private sector, moved to Orange County, North Carolina with his wife, Bethany Dale. And whereas in 1995, Mr. Dowling embarked on a second career in community development and joined the Haytai Development Corporation, an affordable housing nonprofit in Durham. And in 1977, 1997, after a brief time on its board, joined Orange Community Housing Corporation as executive director. And whereas in 2001, under the leadership of Mr. Dowling, Orange Community Housing Corporation merged with the Community Land Trust in Orange County, which had been established in 1999 with the support of the Town of Carborough, Town of Chapel Hill, and Orange County, and which today is known as the Community Home Trust. And whereas throughout his distinguished career, Robert has helped ensure that more than 300 homes in the Carborough Chapel Hill area are permanently affordable to people earning less than 80% of the area median income. Whereas today the Community Home Trust manages a total of 322 affordable single family ground leases and rental apartments with a staff of 10 and a budget of nearly $1.1 million. And whereas Mr. Dowling has served as a faithful advocate representing both Community Home Trust and the Orange County Affordable Housing Coalition at affordable housing tables and before elected bodies, making the case for such policies as investments in a penny for housing, the Orange County Affordable Housing Bond, and a pilot master leasing program. And whereas Robert's work in Orange County has ensured that neighborhoods are diverse and thriving and sustained as such for generations to come, 
And whereas Mr. Dowling is retiring from Community Home Trust on December 31st, 2019, after 22 years in service to our communities and will be missed, now therefore we, the Orange County Board of Commissioners, do hereby recognize and express deep appreciation and respect for the services rendered by Robert Dowling to the Orange County community and wish him well in his retirement. This the second day of December 2019, Penny Rich Chair, Orange County Board of Commissioners. And will you move that? I, I so move this resolution. Second. Pro proclamation. Um, we got, uh, moved in a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Thank you, Robert. to follow I know but you know <laughs> you, you have party that's pretty funny Would you like to say anything, Robert? I, I would like to say uh, thank you. Thank you for this. It's, it's, um, it's been a privilege for me to do this work for all these years. Um, it's, it's been a struggle at times, but I've enjoyed so much support from the local government, starting with the town of Chapel Hill and Orange County in 1998, when I had to come and ask for a bit of a bailout. I don't think there's anybody around now who remembers those days. Um, but we needed $19,000 from the county commission <laughs> in the middle of this fiscal year, and he gave it to us. And today, we have 322 homes in our inventory, and the market value of those homes is at probably more than $50 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And none of that would have happened without the support we've received from the local governments and the community. And, and even this year, I came to you in uh, February mm -hmm. and I asked mm -hmm. for help with mm -hmm. the landings. And it, which let, help which I didn't think we would need, but I, we needed it. And so I wasn't shy about coming and asking and you gave us uh, not just what I asked for, but 20,000 more. And that's kind of support that doesn't happen, I don't think, any place else. So thank you for all the support you've given. And, and I want to call out the manager, who's probably going to hate this, but Bonnie's been extraordinarily uh, helpful to me personally. It's, 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 um, it makes a difference when the manager's interested and, and she wants to understand the challenges and, and can then offer <coughs> her support and, and her trust. As, and as other county um, people around here and around the room who I'm grateful to have been helpful to me over the years, uh, notably Travis, uh, and you, our newest hire, uh, Emma, who in her very short tenure has also been uh, helpful. So thank, thank you f for the proclamation, for all the support that you've given me over 22 years. I know you all haven't been up there for 22 years, but it yeah. feels like it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you, Oh, so I heard a rumor that you put in an application for one of our advisory boards. Is that true? You know what they say about rumors. <laughs> we know where you live, though. I'm taking a sabbatical. <laughs> one year. Okay. And then you'll be Clear back. the decks. Okay. And then I'm going to come up from underground and see what's out there. All right. <laughs> All right. And I'm going to be looking for work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Robert. <laughs> Okay, folks, um, let's move to uh, 4D, and um, this is a, um, the board overview update data about the homelessness in Orange County uh, submitted to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, um, earlier this year, and it is Corey. Thank you, Corey, for being here. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to present this data. My name is Corey Root. I'm the coordinator of the Orange County Partnership in Homelessness. The partnership is funded um, by Orange County and the towns of Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Hillsborough, um, all four jurisdictions. Um, we really appreciate your support um, over the years. 
So um, normally I'm before you a few months earlier than this, uh, once we have the data in our hands, which is usually June. Um, so I try to present it to you when it's hot off the press, but I've been out on maternity leave the last couple months, so I appreciate the opportunity to come even as we're already planning our 2020 point in time count. We're well underway for that, but um, mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that you're up to date on what the current data is. Um, I'm wondering about the PowerPoint. Okay, I'll just keep going. Um, so the first slide, thank you, Dave. Oh, it's right thank you. Okay, so I just wanna ground our discussion in sort of what we're working towards. So this, this graphic shows all of the elements of a well-functioning homeless service system. Um, so there are services that sort of help pe keep people out of our system, uh, which we want to do, or we want to prevent homelessness whenever we can. There are services that help people um, who are, um, you know, living out, outdoors. Um, and then there's a very clear and easy way that folks can access services in a very equitable way that um, program referrals happen in that whole process. Um, so this is what we're working towards. As we'll talk about um, at the end of the presentation, there, there are quite a number, currently 10, um, gaps in our system. Um, but this is kind of the Shangri-La of what we are working towards. Um, and now I want to talk about the data, but I want to give us some context of some numbers that we talk about uh, as sort of categories um, of folks as we talk about a lot with um, people experiencing homelessness. Um, so when we're, we're going to talk about veterans, we're going to talk about folks who um, are either currently in poverty or, or have been in poverty, et cetera. But the, the point of this slide is really that homelessness is very rare, right? So folks do pretty much everything that they possibly can do to avoid the experience of homelessness. How do we know that? Because in our county, um, which is just under 145,000 folks, you know, we have almost 6,000 veterans. Um, we have 18,553 um, folks um, living in poverty. We have 26,815 or so folks living with mental illness and of those um, close to 6,000 with a serious mental illness. So that is categorized of like you're missing work or um, you're on disability, that kind of thing. And 12,320 folks um, struggling with substance use. So the vast, vast majority of those folks are maintaining their housing. And I think that that's a really important context. So we want to not stigmatize and paint with a broad brush of, you know, that these are the people experiencing homelessness. People experiencing homelessness have some of these issues or, or are veterans, that kind of thing. Um, but it's certainly not the vast majority of people in our county um, in those categories. So we're going to look at two sets of data. The first is called the point in time count, um, and the second are system performance measures. So the point in time count um, is sort of like an annual census, although I'm not saying that so much for 2020 because we have a census in 2020. So it's not that, right? It's it's a it's sort of similar to that of we're trying to count every single person experiencing homelessness on one night. Um, there are good things about this um, count, and then there are things that, are, that it doesn't do at all. So we want to be really clear about that. It's a long-standing measure, so we can look back over time, and we're going to do that um, with this data. Um, it's also nationwide, so we can compare ourselves to communities um, in other um, parts of the state and in other parts of the country, et cetera. And it's, um, it's really, it's an accurate number, and, and more so accurate, we feel like, the last couple of years, um, but for one night, right? So what it doesn't do is tell us, long time um, outcomes over time. Um, it also doesn't ex count every single person experiencing housing crisis. The folks that it counts are, are people in shelter, transitional housing programs, and folks um, that are in a place not meant for human habitation. But it doesn't count folks that are counted under other um, federal guidelines, particularly the Department of Education, um, who also count folks that are living doubled up or couch surfing, that kind of thing, living with someone else, not in their own um, space. 
Um, the number can be affected by weather. It's always the last Wednesday in January, so sometimes there, there's weather-related things. And it's also one outcome, the number of people, but as we'll, we'll talk about, that there are other outcomes um, that we also look at as well. Okay, so what was our number for 2019? So on the last Wednesday in January 2019, there are 131 people in our community experiencing homelessness. Of those, 102 were in shelter or transitional housing during the night, and 29 were outside um, on that night. So looking over time, um, this number is just about flat, right? So it's a 3% decrease um, when we look back to 2010, which is the benchmark that statewide and um, nationwide data really start from 2010 um, for a couple of reasons. But um, we can think, okay, well, if it's relatively flat, that's, that's potentially okay. We've had some population growth in Orange County, et cetera. But when we look at numbers nationwide and statewide, the numbers are going down. So in nationwide, there's a 15% decrease overall in the, in the number of people experiencing homelessness, and statewide, almost a quarter, 24%. This isn't an accident. It's because folks know how to end homelessness. They know what to do and how to do it, and folks are putting those programs into play. Um, and we have a lot of low-hanging fruit here in Orange County that we haven't tried yet, which are our gaps. But if we were on track with these decreases, um, with like the North Carolina decreases, instead of 131 folks, we would be looking at more like 103. Um, so that's really what we're working towards um, and what we, um, all the work of the partnership is sort of day in, day out working um, towards. One thing I want to point out also is that we see racial disparities in the number of people experiencing homelessness, particularly for black and African American people. So overall in Orange County, 12% of our population is black or African American. The population of people experiencing homelessness, 51%. So again, this tracks with statewide data, it tracks with nationwide data, and it's not an accident. It's the um, product of both historical, particular discrimination in housing, redlining, um, other particular policies that are that were racially discriminatory, but it's also ongoing racial discrimination that unfortunately we see um, when it comes to housing. Um, and again, we work with all of our wonderful partners on this, and it's something we're not sitting still for, but we do want to point it out. And it's also why we incorporate racial equity goals in our work to end homelessness. We cannot end homelessness without also addressing racial equity. Some good news, um, we have had some very good decreases in um, folks experiencing chronic homelessness. So this obviously sort of by the name is folks who've experienced homelessness for a long time. It's also people who have a disability. So it's disability plus experiencing homelessness for a long time. And since 2010, we've seen a 37% decrease um, in people experiencing homelessness, in chronic homelessness. So why is that? Two reasons. The first is that we've concentrated our federal funding in a program called Permanent Supportive Housing that's particularly um, for people experiencing chronic homelessness. Another is that we have some um, processes that we adopted here pretty early in Orange County in 2012 that other communities have just sort of adopted um, in 2017-18, uh, a little bit later, that really concentrate on um, this population. So um, that's great. We have work to do in families, that number also pretty flat, and also in um, veterans, that number also pretty fat, flat. Although overall the number of veterans experiencing homelessness quite a bit lower than, than other folks. One reason for that is that the, the VA programs are very well funded, um, and we also partner with them quite a bit to, to um, can I ask a question? Please on, do. On the families, it, it took a big dip in 2016. Do you know the reason why that happened? I know you, I don't think you were here then, but I was wondering. Yeah, so 2016, the overall number was a big dip that year. I started in March of that year, okay, I and I thought, oh my gosh, what's happening? <laughs> oh, do we need to throw a parade? Uh, we did not, in fact, throw a parade because when we talked to the service providers and things, people said that that number doesn't look right. So at this point, we view 2016 as, a, as an outlier. Um, and the partnership didn't have full-time staff at that point, and I think there are a number of other factors. But since then, we've also um, increased the way that we count such that we use every single tool that, that HUD lets us use. And we feel that the numbers now while not sort of going the direction we would like are accurate. 
Um, the 2016 number, though, I would not say is accurate. Thank you. But yeah, we see that number same in all these special population numbers as well. Yeah, but overall relatively flat, except for the chronic number. So that's the sort of one night. We also want to look at how we're doing with with lots of all the seven different um, outcomes that that HUD says. So there are seven different ones. Some of them we want to go up. Um, like stabilizing people at risk of homelessness, some we want to go down, like decreasing the length of time homeless. But overall, um, the outcomes are sort of reducing the number of people coming into the system, if we possibly can, and then for the folks that are in the system, getting them exited to permanent housing as quickly as possible. Um, so the ones that are reducing um, the number of people entering the system are sort of in yellow on this graphic and the, the red ones are, are exiting people to permanent housing as quickly as possible. So how do we do um, overall? So we counted 131 people on one night. We also um, report to HUD how many people do we see in the system over the course of the year. Um, and if someone enters the shelter seven times, this metric is just counting, it, it is deduplicated. So they would just be counted one time. So over the course of 12 months, 298 um, people were counted in our system. And of those, 197 are experiencing homelessness for the first time. So the 298 number, again, looking back, and, and these um, outcome numbers we don't have going back to 2010. Um, 2016 was the first year that we reported them um, to HUD, and the first year HUD had them. Um, so again, relatively flat from 2016 of the overall number, but we do see sort of a marked decrease in the number of people experiencing homelessness for the first time. So one thing, especially when we combine that with the next metric, which is um, the average and median length of time homeless, one thing that we know is that folks are getting in our system and not able to exit, right? So instead of seeing more people for the first time, we're seeing the same folks kind of over and over again. They're not exiting to housing. Um, we also see again um, the increase here in our average uh, length of time homeless. So um, there are sort of two metrics, and one was since 2016, and one just started in 2018, um, of how, what is the average either length of stay in our system or the average length of time homeless. So if someone entered the shelter, but they've been experiencing homelessness for two weeks, the, the average length of time homeless would count that entire episode. Um, and our average length of time homeless is, is close to a year, 340 days. The federal goal for that metric is 30 to 90 days. So we are well off of, of where we need to be um, for that metric. Um, we also see an increase in the median. So we know that we have some very long time stayers in our system, and we know this anecdotally as well, the folks that have been in shelter for years and years and years. Um, and again, we just haven't um, used all the tools that are um, available to us and we'll talk about those gaps. For folks exiting, um, we this is relatively stable. Also, we've hovered between 29 and 37 percent. We reported 33 percent exits um, to permanent housing overall system-wide. Um, one thing to note is that is a decrease overall in exits. So um, it, this in 2019, there were 73 total exits compared with 106 exits in, in 2016. Um, so it's, it's a decrease in the overall number. The percentage is about the same, however. And then if we're doing all this work and exiting um, folks um, to permanent housing and they're just returning to homelessness, that's a complete waste of time. It's a waste of resources. It can be also be detrimental if someone then has further arrears and you know evictions on their records, et cetera. So we also look at returns to homelessness. Um, and so that is 18% this year. Um, so some of these numbers have pretty low denominators, and so the percentages can look a little um, strange. Um, but overall, um, what's considered pretty good is 20% or under na nationwide. So it, we're, lo we're looking at a big increase from last year from 6% to 18%, but 6% is sort of unheardofly low, um, although we'd love to be there and have that be real. Um, but 18% is, is um, an increase, but not out of whack nationally. But again, if we're talk looking at the total number of exits, this just counts permanent housing exits, um, looking back in the database two years. Um, and 
we're at about half the number um, in 2019 from 2016. So we want to definitely have those the percentage low, but also look at what are the total number of permanent housing exits and increase those. Okay, I have a question about yes. this. Um, if you could explain this a little bit more. So um, it says from shelter. This means that uh, um, that, that first line, for example. Yes. Return, um, so they returned to homelessness within two years. They had been staying in the shelter. Yeah. And then they. So we're going to get in the weeds here. So <laughs> this is, first of all, it's the federal fiscal year, which I find the, the goofiest one of all, but it's October um, to September. Um, and this is looking at everyone who exited from October 2015 to September 2017. Um, so all of the folks that had positive exits. So it doesn't count folks that, that just stayed in the shelter, only folks that exited and exited to permanent housing. So of those that exited between October 2015 and September 2017, how many returned back to homelessness? How many then did we see in the database between October 2017 and um, September 2018? So from shelter, um, if we're looking at um, 2019, mm -hmm. of the folks that were in shelter and exited to permanent housing, 43% then were, were in our system again at least one year later. Um, okay. Yeah. And what, what is transitional housing? So transitional housing in our system is the men's shelter. Um, so that's ISC Community House. It is it is designated as a transitional housing program per HUD. It operates in our system as um, a shelter, but that's, we're such a small community, we can like pinpoint the mm -hmm. program in a lot of cases. So in that case, what's our shelter? The shelter is um, Home Start, which is okay. the women and families yeah. um, program. Oh, but that's interesting. Yes, which is designated as a shelter, which is possible. The Good Neighbor Plan, which, um, community house had to enter into to, for the siting on, on Martin Luther King um, really designates that it must be a transitional housing program. Thank you. And, and that brings us to our gaps. Um, so I've, I've said a couple of times we know what to do and we know how to do it to end homelessness. This is it, right? So we need to fill our, the gaps in our homeless service system. Um, we started the gaps in 2017, um, and a couple of those have been filled since those time. We, we currently have 10 system gaps. Um, rapid rehousing, which is the sort of bread and butter of any homeless service system, it's the program that serves 80, 90 plus plus percent of folks experiencing homelessness with some combination of financial assistance and services. Um, that, at this point, is, is entirely missing from our system. And a fully funded program is, is right about a million dollars for, for the need that we're currently seeing in our system. Um, there are a number of other gaps. A street outreach program, um, which would help people living unsheltered connect to services and housing. Um, that's a, another program, but then also the accessible housing focused shelter. So um, our um, current men's shelter, which the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness, uh, 75 to 80% are single men in, in, our, in our system, but also nationwide. Um, so, and our men's shelter is currently not accessible, so folks cannot just walk up to the shelter or take the bus to the shelter or things like that. You have to have an appointment in advance. Um, this is, again, per the Good Neighbor Plan, and it's not a housing-focused shelter. It is a transitional housing program. So this is a, a current gap in the system. And um, for the first time this year, we, we totaled up to say, okay, if we were to fill all the gaps that we, that we know what the exact um, number would be, um, we're, we're looking at uh, $1.7 million in additional annual funding um, that we would be looking for. Commissioner Dorsey, yeah. So um, if, uh, if you're looking at this slide, is there, you know, is there any priority to these? If we wanted to say, as I want to right now, that we're going to commit to putting some money in our budget this year to fill some <coughs> of these gaps, 
would you be able to identify or would the partnership be able to identify sort of the highest priorities and the, you know, or, or you know, if you could get um, to be able to do that? Yes, so when we initially um, published the gaps in 2017, we did a process we, where we prioritized those gaps and we took input from um, service providers, from state experts, and then from people experiencing homelessness. And the partnership leadership team, which I believe you served on at that time. I think I remember that, yeah. yeah. Um, ended up taking the, the prioritization of people experiencing homelessness directly. Um, and at that time, rapid rehousing was the number one prioritized gap. It's in our plan to do that reprioritization of just come back from attorney leave. So we can, we can also do that prioritization again. But at that time, rapid rehousing was the number one priority. Which is also the highest cost one of everything. Yes. Yeah. So, well, it would be good to know that. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know if we're at the comment period yet. Please. So, I mean, well, I, I think that, you know, there's, I mean, Corey said a couple of things in her presentation, which was excellent, by the way, um, that, that give me, you know, grave concern. You know, the idea that there's low-hanging fruit that we're not, um, that we're not, I don't, I don't know what the rest of the metaphor would be, that we're not harvesting. Um, and it seems like we, we ought to be able to do that, and I think that, uh, um, you know, it, it, this, is, this seems like a case where, unlike, say, some of the other complicated problems we deal with, like affordable housing or, um, you know, overall anti-poverty type stuff, that we have experts that sort of know what, what needs to get done and know what works. Um, and, and no, you know, and there's a, you know, there's a great network of providers and everyone else. And so it seems like, um, you know, I mean, 1.7 million is a lot of money, um, but it's not, you know, in the, what's our annual budget? 200 and 220 million. Yeah, so in the grand scheme of things, it's not, you know, so I think we ought to be thinking about, and I would like, you know, to suggest that we think about, you know, over the next, you know, several years, five years, three years, whatever, being able to, to address some of these needs and being able to push for that. So I don't, I, I'll just put that out there as a comment and as a, you know, as we're, I guess, getting close to the time where we start talking about the budget, um, to be thinking about that. Um, I think Commissioner the manager Green. wanted to respond. To oh, I'm sorry, point. did you want to? Uh, uh, well, the please. one thing that I would say is that the way that the partnership request comes in, budget request comes in, it comes in from the executive team of the partnership, which includes the other jurisdictions. And um, so 1.7 isn't all county. Right. And um, I would encourage I think Commissioner Green is on the executive committee to work with the other electeds to talk about how we do do get some low hanging fruit because I, I don't think setting the precedent that the county come in and take care of it. We did something like that last year. We took care of the CEF um, mm -hmm. part and we took care of it, the county took care of it and we said, you know, that we didn't want to do that again. We wanted it to be a partnership because it is a partnership. So I just wanted to remind you all of that. No, and I appreciate that and I wasn't suggesting that uh, the county goes solo, so, but I thank you for that. I, I was suggesting that we, the collective, yeah. we take that on. And before Commissioner Green speaks, uh, um, we, we did talk about um, possibly having this report at the Assembly of Government, but maybe we need to do more than a report. Maybe we need to have a little bit of a conversation as well. We'll see that, that agenda keeps growing though, so we'll see how we can get it in there, but it would be nice if we could, a, as a, 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 all in a room together. Um, well, and I think that Corey will be going to the other jurisdictions and doing the report for okay. the other elected bodies, so they're gonna hear the same thing you're hearing tonight. That's great. So, When's that um, Assembly of Government's meeting? 25th of January. Will, will that everyone have, you're taking your show on the road before then? Yes, um, I, I do go around all of the jurisdictions. Sometimes the timing is a bit different, so it's, I usually come to you with sort of the latest data, and when I'm talking with them, sometimes it's, it's data, um, it's in March or April, so I don't have the current year data, it's the previous data, but it's the, it's the same message regardless. 
It might be good to start planting that seed, though, if, if we are serious about filling the gaps. Commissioner Green, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to well, jump in. No, um, Commissioner Dorson, I want to thank you for really um, sort of responding that sort of jumpstart way because that's that's exactly right. We have we have an expert, we have a whole team of experts, um, and, and Corey has been singing this song for not just a little while, you know, for a couple of years now, ever since this report came out. We know what the priorities are and um, we know how to how to do it. I don't know how to do it, but she has a team of folks who know how to do it. And uh, the answer is funding. I mean plain and simple the answer is funding. If to the question of well what would you do if you had 100% uh, of the money you need for rapid rehousing, uh, the answer is they, they can find the housing, they can find the social workers to help, they can provide the services. It really is a matter of we need to get, if, if we need to put our money where our mouths are. If we want to solve homelessness in Orange County, we can do it. So I think it's a great um, suggestion to have this conversation in person with our, I mean, certainly the, the small group of us who are elected officials need to communicate with our boards, but, but to have some kind of presentation <laughs> and discussion uh, when we're all in the room together and to try to get some sort of momentum to say, yes, we can, and yes, we will, would, would really be fantastic. And um, uh, so, in, but, but as Corey kind of suggested, one of the big par problems with us not, e not having um, some capacity here is the setup of the men's shelter. And I was on the town council, uh, and some of y'all were, were, and so was Penny. I think some of us were, were, uh, were uh, in this world when uh, the director, Chris Moran, announced he was going to change the model from um, a shelter to this transitional step-by-step -step program. And he said in many venues, that means that Orange County will no longer have a homeless shelter for men. And he just put it out there that this was the case. Now, he also changed the model. <laughs> so uh, that situation has been there for a long time. So it wasn't just the good neighbor plan that's, that's in the way. I mean, the housing, the, the plan could probably be, I mean, the facility could be reorganized. What goes on in there could be re reorganized so that it becomes a shelter. But it was already a different kind of program when it started before the good neighbor plan got laced on top of it, which just makes it harder. So, um, so there, there is a little community work to do there, but fundamentally we have the know-how and we have what we need to, to uh, make a big difference here. And I think it's time, it's time to take some action on, on our part. Commissioner Markopoulos? So given that rapid rehousing is a high priority and that funding is the biggest barrier and the fact that we've all read about apparently successful efforts around the country with tiny home homeless communities what would be well <coughs> step back a second it, it, so of course there are wraparound services that you would want to provide there they're going to cost just as much whether they're wrapped around more expensive housing or not right but given <coughs> that we have <coughs> access to our own land potentially as a little sliver of the green track could provide for us. And given that these homes are very inexpensive to construct and we could probably even get uh, high school vocational training classes to help, we could even, even employ people who need jobs to build them. Would, am I right in thinking that a 20 to 30 unit a uh, homeless community of tiny homes would have a major impact on the situation? Absolutely. 20 to 30 units of, of anything, I think, would, would really be in, in tiny homes. Um, absolutely. We've seen this in other communities. But 20 to 30 units of, of sort of any ilk would, would make a big impact. Most of the folks we see in our, our system are singles. Um, I'm not single, but I am interested in, in tiny homes. I, I think that they, I mean, just personally, I, I find them really interesting. Not everyone does, though, and I think that that's a really important thing. It, it's a great part of the solution. It, it's not that tiny homes, though, are going to end homelessness by themselves. We do have families. Um, we do have other folks um, that are just not interested in tiny homes for whatever reason. So I think it's one one part of a, of a solution um, of, of different units. Folks want to live in different places and you know for, for whatever reasons but yeah I think that that would have a huge impact so how could we what's the best way to pull information together to provide it 
to people in the community to have a, a informed discussion about it. What, what do you think we should do? Yeah, there's there's a lot of information. Uh, the Raleigh is building a, a tiny homes community, so we don't have to go far down the road to find um, folks that have done, done this already. Um, Austin has a very famous one. Um, there there are a number of folks that have you know we, we would not have to sort of reinvent the wheel here at all. Yeah, but I think um, one word that you mentioned I just would want to underline is community. Um, and so the folks even locally that have been doing this, Pee Wee Homes, and then um, in Chatham County, the farm at Penny Lane, community is a big part of, of what's happening. Um, and there are you know, community events, and, and it really is a community of folks, and, and that's a really key um, component, as well as the housing. Commissioner Price and Commissioner Green. Um, I have a question about the... Uh, the I guess it's, yeah, the, well, the slide where you talk about the gap and the rapid rehousing, you have full implementation and then the phase. So um, does that mean that what, the, the full cost, which is, you know, uh, just over a million dollars, would that be uh, one time or would this be like every year you're saying you need, to, okay. It's ongoing annual. And then if, we, if you did the phase, you would just, like next year, you would only ask for $364,000? Right, that's a, a great um, point. So another thing that the executive team asked for um, is a, a phased implementation, recognizing that we're going to look at a, like a big overall number, potentially. Um, so where it was possible, um, I, for each of the gaps, um, developed like a year one, year mm -hmm. two, year three. Um, so that's in the, the full gaps analysis document. Right, so um, then, uh, uh, for the rapid rehousing, would that um, one million dollars after year three? Would that be year four? Would also be a million? And exactly. Yes. Okay. So then, my next question: When you get to the street outreach, um, the annual cost, the full annual cost, um, is the same as year two if you phase it in, and then it goes up. Why is yeah. So for that program, so for each program, it's sort of its own yeah. thing, right? So um, for rapid rehousing, to, to meet the current need would be serving about 90 households per year. And that breaks down, you know, uh, for social worker averages um, very well to okay. what a caseload would be for three social workers. So that breaks down pretty easily. For the street outreach program, our current need is, is two instead of three full-time um, folks at the peer support level as opposed to LCSW or whatnot. So that's why we would just, it would, year three wouldn't be a big um, jump per se. Yeah, okay, I see. And then on this chart here, um, wh what of those activities are you doing now with the funding? And, and I guess, let me back up a bit. What is your budget right now? Um, I could look up that number. Numbers go out of my head so quickly. I, will, okay, well, I can look up that like, exact number for you. Well, okay, so what out of that list are, are you doing at this point? So, um, so there are a couple of gaps that are partially filled. Is that, is that what I'm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, are we doing, in any of this, are we doing in, uh, enough? Well, no, I know you're not, we're not doing enough. Um, but, um, like street outreach, you're doing that, but at what percentage of that cost right there? I mean, so the currently for street outreach, um, we just have sort of a by hook or by crook um, way that we try to go about that. It, it's the gap is pretty significant, so even our efforts um, don't come close to filling the gap. The Chapel Hill. Um, crisis unit, the, the social workers that work with the police department in Chapel Hill, they're sort of our go-to folks, even kind of outside of the town limits. They will, um, if, if someone's experiencing homelessness and there's someone that needs to, someone needs to talk with them, um, they will be our, our first call. Um, we also have folks that work with the Orange County Criminal Justice Resource Department. Um, so if someone's in, involved with the criminal justice um, system, which is uh, common, um, then, then those folks will help us um, reach out to, to those folks. There's some folks in Hillsboro. Um, there's a church um, in Hillsboro that, that helps us uh, love Hillsboro, particularly with, um, with folks in Hillsboro. So it, it's just that we have things that are 
real band-aid solutions. Okay, um, so really everything on this list, if, if I should say when you get the funding instead of if, when you get the funding, would almost be a new program or putting a, an actual program in place. That's right. Um, the youth, youth Host Homes program, that is an existing program serving mostly a Durham County residents. Mm -hmm. So that it would be an expansion into Orange of an existing program. Um, rapid rehousing um, was funded and will um, start at DSS um, as starting in January. So that's something that um, there's uh, $40,000 in, in state um, ESG emergency solutions grant funding. So that's that's well below our yeah that's our cost, but that's something. So that would be something again that we could expand um, potentially. Um, the day center with services, there's something at Community Empowerment Fund, CEF, the Orange Community Hub that is some co-located services. So there's some things that are sort of inklings of happening, but it, it's really, it would be a, quite a bit of a new program activities. I would activities. just say that, you know, you know $1.7 million may seem like a lot, but when you're providing services for people, um, I think, and being proactive, that it actually would want, we would wind up saving money in a way, and and, and, and actually you know in the human resources as well the people, uh, I, I think it, this is similar to you know going to the hospital to the emergency room, it's it it costs more to do that than to actually address the, the program. So, Ms. Manager, I hope we can um, move forward on some of these programs. And yeah, thank and it's you for only this forty report. percent of that is our share, so that's like half a million dollars. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so um, on, on that note, for example, the coordinated entry staffing, it's not that it's not being done, but, but uh, it's being done ad hoc, right? You're doing some of it. Your, your intern is doing some of it. CEF does some of it. Um, so it would, it would be a great resource, be, it would be a great time saver and would be much more efficient to have a point person or two to do that. For Absolutely, example. and there are sort of large chunks right. of things not yeah. being done that would help our system. Sure, as well. right, right, right. Um, the other thing I was going to say um, was just back to Commissioner Markopoulos's point about the tiny homes. I'm kind of, yeah, I mean, they're, they, they sound really nifty, but they're not the solution to everything. And uh, what the term we really need to get on the table here is, is uh, housing first, because that's what this model is. It goes back a number of years now uh, where the idea has, has moved from, well, if you're drunk, we're going to get you sober and get you in, in your programs first before you deserve a home. That's all been turned around with the more commonsensical um, and, and uh, data-driven result that, no, you put them in a home first and then they've got some stability and are more likely to get the services that they need. Um, but for example, Charlotte has a big apartment complex or some, something that, that is, um, is a community and it's a housing first community and they get a lot of good cred for it. And I have some folks who sometimes ask me, why aren't we doing housing first? Which we are doing housing first every chance we can. It's just we don't have a big apartment complex to say this is where we're doing housing first. But to get back to the point, there is a number of ways to put wraparound services around someone. And it kind of doesn't matter where you put them. Well, it does matter in a way, but it doesn't have, doesn't, whether it's in a tiny house or an apartment complex, it's not that big a deal. And I just want to thank you, Corey, again for, for all of this very clear, um, clear presentation and um, um, thank my colleagues for understanding that it is a lift, but it would be a really great thing if we could do because it would really solve a lot of problems for a lot of people. And has this been presented to the partnership already? Have you all gone over these numbers? And, oh, yeah. and what do... How does how do you think um, it's received with our partners in this? Oh, they they've they've been creating this. Oh, oh you mean our partner jurisdictions? Yes, um, our partner jurisdictions. I don't know. Have you? T are we the first ones you've presented to? No. Um, yeah, I've, <laughs> starting with the 2019 roadshow, <laughs> going around to the different groups, we've talked about the gaps and the and the numbers, and I think folks are in agreement that it sounds like something good that we should do, but I don't know that there have been a, a formal proposal made. Okay. Wait, so, so have you made this presentation to the Chapel Hill Council yet? 
about the gaps, but with the 2018 data oh, okay. that I had okay. at that time. But, okay. But with the same information with the gaps, um, but the gaps, the 2018 gaps. So. Well, the reason I ask is I don't want to fall into that same circumstance like the manager just explained where we're really excited about right. trying <clears throat> to help and then we are the partners that are um, supposed to be with us on this are not excited about helping. Right. So this is what I'm trying to get at is have you're here now and we're going to meet at the assembly governments in January either like last month or next month or have you how recently have you made a presentation like this to Chapel Hill or Carpera or Hillsborough? It was in March and April of last year. Okay, so it's not fresh on their minds. Commissioner Markopoulos? So based on what Commissioner Green said, how do we get information on the cost of such an apartment complex? Is that something that we can get our hands on? Yeah, so that would be, a, I mean, it sounds like we're talking about site-based permanent supportive housing. Um, Similar yeah. to the Charlotte project that she yeah. mentioned, just have a comparison of and what that might cost. Right, so that model um, is normally in, in larger cities. We have the same program, but in a scattered site model. So as opposed to having um, a com you know one building with all the, the units in it, we rent different units around the community and it's the same type model where, where services wrap around. Um, Raleigh is also building a site-based permit supportive housing, but I don't know of any communities our size that have site-based. So it would be a really innovative approach. Um, and Carbro did express interest in, in site-based permanent supportive housing as well. Um, okay. Commissioner Price? Just one more thing, and um, I had this question, and now you're talking about sites. Um, with any of these programs, have, has there been discussion about where these facilities would be? Because I think they're, based on work that I've done in the past, there's going to need to be some community outreach to, so we don't run into that NIMBY, you know, um, scenario. And you know, just the stigma of homelessness to a lot of people. Um, but you have discussed the location of some of these and potential areas where they would go. Yeah, I mean, I think for some of them, it's it's really key uh, where the location is. So, for example, for the bathrooms, it's not sort of like any bathrooms. Like there are 24-hour bathrooms in downtown Chapel Hill and, and Carborough. Mm -hmm. um, that is the gap. Um, Having bathrooms up here in Hillsborough is great, but that's not where, where people need them. So for, for some of them, the location is really key. Um, obviously, the location was a big factor in the um, community house and those discussions. So I think we're really sensitive around recognizing that we do have a gap of an accessible housing focused shelter. Um, you know, is the solution to that gap going to be that community house transitions into that program or that we build a new shelter elsewhere. I think there's not consensus on that currently and that's um, and the location has a lot to do with that. So we really want to come to community consensus before we go forward um, with filling that gap. Um, and there are others where, you know, we we for a day center, um, folks need to be able to get to it so it needs to be on a bus line. So they're they're very particular you know, location considerations, and we recognize that there's uh, going to be potential concerns oh, yeah. and want to partner with folks in advance of that and, and reach out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a big conversation. <laughs> Get home to that baby. Yeah. Um, We'll see. We'll we'll talk a little bit more and see what we want to bring up at the assembly government. And, and if you could just let us know when you're going to the other towns, so we can see if that even fits with the assembly government conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I would suggest that any of us who have any contacts on uh, any of those other boards just reach out individually and say, you know, the commissioners are interested in putting some of this 1.7 million dollars in the budget, and since we each have a share, I mean. If we took half of it, if we took a million dollars, you know, that's we could look at the percentages, right? That's four hundred thousand for us. It's four hundred thousand for you know Chapel Hill, and so I mean, each of us has at least one ally on one of those boards, and say, look, would you be willing to p be pushing this from 
uh, you know, the inside on your sink. I mean, I think showing up at the Assembly of Governments meeting and saying we want to prioritize this puts us back in the situation where, you know, we get the pushback, well, go ahead and you do it, you know, whereas I think if, you know, if each of us has an ally and, I mean, Sally can talk to the, each of the members of the executive committee and, but each of us could have, you know, has at least one pally on one of those boards that we could say, hey, you know, would you be willing to bring this up in your, you know, in the, when you, in your initial budget talks or something else? I mean, I think if, I think it's sort of, you know, any of these intergovernmental collaborative efforts is going to take more than just, you know, the Assembly of Governments meeting or the MMCs or the things, you know, I, so I think, you know, we, we, we've got to get, we need allies pushing, uh, you know, from the inside on in their respective jurisdictions. And, and I'm certainly going to do that and reach out to folks I know on each of the boards and see if we can't. And then we'll just know if this is not a priority for them, then, then that'll be a good thing for us to know. And it'll be, that's a good thing for us to talk about at the Assembly of Governments meeting. I think, you know, we either make progress on this stuff or we have to own that it's not a priority. I mean, we collectively. Obviously, for this board, I think it is, but that's my suggestion. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah. So Thank everybody you, write that down in your notebook. All right. <coughs> Got it. Okay. Um, we have no public hearings tonight. So let's move to the regular agenda. And this is um, A is the approval of a budget amendment 3-A for the receipt of an emergency solutions grant, creation of, a, of one FTE limited position allocating current medical, mental, I'm sorry, current mental health maintenance of effort funds. Good Did evening. Did I get that right? That was like. I know, it's kind of a little too much there, huh? Well, yeah, that was a lot. Thank you. So I'm Nancy Costin. I'm the social services director here. This is about rapid rehousing. So actually, this is some of the federal funds that can, although they're very small, uh, help with some of the stuff that we've been discussing that you've been hearing from with Corey. And so we, um, so for the county, we have applied for the funds for the county. County decided that we would be the group to at least administer this. The problem we've had in the past with rapid rehousing is it, it comes in such a small amount of money that you can't get the staffing that you need to do the work with the persons. And so in looking at that, we're asking to use some of the maintenance of effort money for mental health services, since that relates to many of the people we're trying to serve and use that to staff a time-limited position out of the maintenance of effort money so that the $40,000 of actual ESG grant money could be used to pay for the actual cost of housing. So that's the proposal. We asked to create a time-limited position for the six, well, for 12 months, but we will put the funding in now for it, and then in the budget process, we'll have more conversations with the manager and housing director and Corey and other people about what's going to happen next, but we're at least trying to make sure the money gets to Orange County to get used in this way. So that's our proposal. We also asked to use 25000 of unobligated uh, maintenance of effort money to help our families who have custody issues with children who cannot get mental health and substance abuse treatment because they do not have insurance or Medicaid. And I don't see that they're going to. So um, we're trying to deal with what seems to be a really f unjust, situation, unjust situation happening with our parents who uh, need to be making improvements quickly under all these new requirements so that they can try to, regain, to keep or regain custody of their children. So that is the basic proposal, is to accept the 40000 in federal funds that is available for rapid rehousing to pay for the rents and cost of housing people, use the maintenance of effort money instead of that money to pay for the staffing cost, and to try to at least get started on some of this activity. 40000 I know, is not a lot to pay for rents and ongoing costs, but at least we're, uh, it's, it's sort of, you know, what we do. We do the ones we can, so that's where we're starting. Thank you, Nancy. Questions for Nancy? Just, yeah. Can you just explain very briefly how um, how they're going to work with folks to, to on that, you know, regaining custody or, you know, sort of what the, what specifically they might do to help those parents? So, right, we already, we already have put in a contract with limited amount of money to have counselors come to our offices to help people have accessibility. Because we've got some people who need specialized counselors 
they don't have ways to get to the places those individuals might be. So the, the MOE would actually pay the cost of the counseling, pay to have a contractor for the person to come wherever we can get the families to come to, whether it's one of our buildings or wherever is, is gonna work. Because right now, it's a 12 months that you're supposed to have a permanent plan with a child in your custody. And so if there's a delay of months getting them into treatment, we all know it takes a lot longer than 12 months to recover from many of these uh, situations they're in. And so if we can't at least show the court that they are have an avenue to improve, which seems very unfair if they don't actually have anybody they can actually see. So we're at least trying to take away that one barrier that they do have a person they can go to to report back to the court. They've had their counseling, they've had substance abuse treatment, they've had the things that they couldn't afford to get in other places. So that's what we're hoping for. Great. We also are doing with some of our older youth and trying to prep, prepare them for independent living. Because one of the things that we know is if they have not re reunited with their parents by the time they turn 18, the situation gets much more difficult for some of those teens because they don't have a family to go to. And many of us know that 18 year olds are not quite ready. Most 18 year olds, I'm, I'm sure there are many that are, but there are a lot of 18 year olds that without the support system that naturally occurs with families, they have a very difficult time making it no matter what their other strengths are. It just, it's just too many barriers. So those are the kinds of folks we're trying to work with. We've had success with a couple already, so in our small grant, so we're looking to make this bigger. Appreciate that, thank you. Questions, comments, I was, gonna, Becker? I was gonna move the resolution. <laughs> Recommendation. Second. I think we're there. So. Okay, yeah. um, I move approval of the one, two, three recommendations from the manager. Second. Second. We have a second on that and any more comments on that discussion? Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Against? Okay, thank you, Nancy. Thank you for hanging with us. Um, there are no reports. Consent agenda, would anyone like to pull anything? Okay. Move the consent agenda. I'll second that. Okay, moved and second. Um, <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Okay. Moving on. Manager's report. I have nothing to report this evening. Thank you. <laughs> An attorney's report. Uh, real quickly, um, in, in case some of you weren't aware, the, a three-judge panel today allowed the federal um, congressional district redistricting maps drawn last month to go forward. Um, uh, the only good news is the uh, General Assembly is in recess until the middle of next month, so I uh, can't do any harm in the meantime. So. <laughs> can, can you tell us what's the status of uh, the um, impact fee case was supposed to be heard in uh, this month, and it's been to let, do you have any update on that? The, the, the actual part that was supposed <coughs> to be hearing was the certification of the class not the merits of the case. Um, when the uh, Superior Court judge ap approved and certified the group of unknown uh, impact fee uh, payers as a class, uh, that, was a, that decision was appealed. And so that's what was scheduled and has been continued due to, um, uh, I believe, uh, personal leave by uh, the opposing counsel. So, it's not been rescheduled yet, but uh, I will let the board win, uh, know when that happens. It, it will be heard in Raleigh. Okay. Um, there are some information <coughs> items, of course, in the back. And then um, I just wanted to mention that this was the first time in our consent agenda that we approved the um, positions to the boards. So that process um, will follow through now with um, the clerk's office and those folks will be um, aware that they have been selected. And um, if no one has anything else, we can adjourn. We need a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Finally got a second. It's hard enough. It's hard enough. It's Thank <laughs> you.